Well, good evening, brothers and sisters, and um, <clears throat> thank you for coming to this evening's talk. As we continue on our studies with August, son of Yake, it's been a while since we last looked at Orga, and so I think it would be quite advantageous for us to actually just do a bit of a recap of where we started our journey with Ogre and where we've got to at this moment in time. In Ogre we see a quite an amazing character because he is a man that reflects qualities that most of us would only dream of having because he reflects a very, very humble spirit. And in actual fact, he goes so far as to say that if you want to be acceptable to God, then you need to be humble. And he goes on to say that he absolutely abhors anyone who elevates himself in their own eyes and that they should lower their self. And you can see from the statement there, he says, I have wearied myself, I have wearied myself. And then he goes on to say that I'm more stupid than any man. And I have not the understanding of a man. I have never, never learned wisdom. Nor do I have the knowledge of the holy. And when we analyze that, it's quite an amazing set of statements, isn't it? Because it's not something that comes natu naturally to us as human beings. <coughs> We find it very difficult to actually say words like that. And then he goes on to extend his view. <clears throat> and he looks at nature around him. And he looks at the sky. And he looks at the wind and the waters. And he's just amazed with it. And he's in awe of this amazing God that we worship the creator of heaven and earth. And you can imagine, because he would have lived in a time, brothers and sisters, that we would be totally unfamiliar with. Because we are so, so used to technology, of hearing everything about the achievements that man has made. And he would have looked at the sky, and man hadn't actually mastered the art of flight. And he would have looked and thought to himself, well, only the gods can do that. Only Yahweh, the creator, who comes down from heaven and goes back up. And this is the one that I worship. And he would have looked at the wind. And it's just a simple thing like the wind blowing through his hair and holding his hands up and in between his fingers. And it would have amazed him because he could feel it. But he had absolutely no control of it, nor did any of the people that he knew at the time. And he would have looked at the sea and known and experienced, well, probably heard of the sea because he was in Saudi Arabia, so I don't think there were many beaches there, but he would have read of that because he was familiar with God's word. And through God's word, he would have known just by looking at the clouds and looking at the stars and recognizing the absolute power and majesty of the creator of both heaven and earth. And perhaps he came to this kind of image in his mind to think how easy would it have been for the God that I know, that is the giver of all life, to have formed the small little habitation called earth in comparison with the huge magnificence of the stars at night as he looked about him. And then he goes on by looking and examining himself and examining the absolute futility of man and looking at the behavior of people around him and looking at his own personal behavior and his own personal shortcomings. And he would have realized just how all the different things that we fight every single day in our life, just how much of an impact they had on him and how they affected him and how every single day was a struggle for him and how he had to put and abase himself and elevate God because ultimately man has no chance of salvation, no hope, no chance of life without God. 
And so he implores upon us to put aside all the different emotions and all the different feelings that we have so many times in our life. And he says, gather the wisdom of God. And he says, every word of God is pure. He says, do not add to it, do not take away from it. He says, because you will bring a curse upon yourself. And he says, that is what I aspire to. And then he asks the question that of who would abide in God's tabernacle? And he goes on to say that the house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright, and that word upright is the righteous, the righteous will flourish. And it's a beautiful word as we looked at that word flourish, because it means blossom. And it means just like it says that the desert shall blossom. And he would have looked and he would have seen those words. And you can imagine that he that's the kind of environment he lived in. That's the kind of natural surrounding that Orga was used to. And you can just imagine when he was reading words like this and he was thinking to himself that it says that the desert is going to bloom. It's going to blossom. It's going to become alive again. And it will be almost inconceivable for him to actually think that and he would have looked and tried to imagine in his mind how is this possible unless done by an all-loving all-powerful God that has the entire universe in his hands and it would have been the opportunity of seeing just a glimpse of what it could possibly be. And then one day, brothers and sisters, one day, the rain came. As it does in the desert. And it gets a massive downpour. And suddenly, if he had any doubt because of the hardships of life that he was going through, and as he looked around him and almost closed his eyes and opened them up again to coin a phrase, you would see just how God can change everything. The God that promises us life, brothers and sisters. And suddenly, from the little hint of life to the desert blossoming. And he would see this transformation. And so he would read God's word and he would read and he would think to himself when it talks about the transformation that happens in our life from the time we go from being in the world to being in the truth. And he would equate it to that. And he would go on his hands and knees, brethren, and he would pray to God and he would thank God for the opportunity that has given us and the blessings he has given us. And within 24 hours, because that's just how long it takes, that desert that he would have been looking at just the day before, that was dead and barren, was suddenly a valley of life and beauty. And he would have read, brothers and sisters, about how the world will change when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and how the, this world will become a place of refuge for those that have put their trust in Yahweh and at all times keep his word focused as frontlets to their eyes. And like I showed you, even the locals agreed to that, brothers and sisters. And then he looked more deeply in himself and he looked at deceit and lies. And he realized, brothers and sisters, just by looking around him, that that is the worst thing that can possibly happen to a person. And he said to God, two things I ask of thee, I want those things far away from me. Not just far away. I want them so far that there is no possibility of them ever affecting my life and of them ever coming between me and between you. Between me and my salvation. And he looks at the balance of love and he realizes that deception and love and lies 
is that little spark, brothers and sisters, that happens with every single one of us. And it just creeps in through the back door and it grabs hold of us and it starts a whole host of problems within our own personal lives. And all the looks at that. And you can see that just around him in the population and the people and in a way of life of people around him. And he says, please God, I don't want either of those things. I want them to be removed very far away from me. And then he starts looking away from himself. And he starts taking his focus off the mirror, as it were. And he starts looking at the people that are in close proximity to him. The ecclesia, those that are around him. Those that he would speak to and possibly converse with in relation to God's word. And discuss the magnitude and the beauty of the promises that God has offered. And that's when reality starts settling in. Because that's when, brothers and sisters, he looks at it and he realizes just what a problem human nature really is. And he would see, he would see, and as he warns us, not to slander. Because it only takes the smallest of sparks, brothers and sisters, to settle in and disrupt. And so what he does is he makes this beautiful use of words as Olga is absolutely astounding when he uses words. He is so meticulous about using words. Words that are used once or twice in the entire of scripture, he places them very carefully in there to bring about a picture to us. And he uses a word which is to be abated. And he makes it as reference to the ark. The ark of our covenant. Our covenant with God, our sanctuary, brothers and sisters. And he makes reference to how we ought to, at all times, at all times, we need to be staying in that ark. We need to be protecting it as best as we can. Because he uses the word abated and the word subside. And what he brings the point home very carefully is this, that if we are not to sink to a lower level, if that's not what we want within our life and within our ecclesial life and within the ecclesia itself, then we have to make 100% sure, brothers and sisters, that we have a very firm and a very strong foundation. Because he says, and he brings across the point, that living, brothers and sisters, doesn't happen instantaneously. Leaven happens very slowly and very subtly. It creeps in from just a very small thing. And we saw that example of the Cheyenne Indians, of how they spoke about the thing that absorbed people's mind. And we asked the question is, do we feel it? And that is the question that Orga was asking. And he was imploring to his brothers and sisters that please do not fuel the fire. So much that he brings across the point is, because if you do that, you will become like the horse leash, which will get onto you and will never, never give up until it has everything. Because that's what it does. It will leech on with those two little fangs over there, and it will keep on pumping blood into itself to the point that it will just explode. It has an insatiable desire. And that is why he uses that word. And so we come to this evening's two verses. And it's a beautiful, beautiful few verses. Because now Olga, having examined all those beauties around, he realizes that man is desperate for help. And once again, he looks at nature. Because you have to remember, brothers and sisters, this was the perfect opportunity for a man who would be constantly absorbing things that were going on around him. And these are things, just the nature itself, 
that would inspire him. And so he gives those words. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. And so what he does is he gives, in two little verses, he gives a number sonnet and a proverb. And it's very interesting of how he used that, just to encourage us. He says, the way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Now, when we look at the eagle, it's actually quite interesting because in this particular case of here, it's believed by most of the scholars that it is the word dikhe, which is probably the griffin vulture. But the beauty of it is, is the absolute wingspan of this creature. And it just almost floats in the air. Once it's in the air, brothers and sisters, you can stay up there for hours almost effortlessly. But it is so called because of the tearing its prey with its beak and referred for, to for its swiftness, swiftness of flight. It's mounting high in the air, it's strength. And this is the beauty of Augur. He looks at it and he says to himself, how is it possible for that bird to stay in the sky like that? And everything that he does, brothers and sisters, every single mention of every single example that he does, he makes reference and he relates it to God and says just how awesome his God really is. And so it is, when we look at God's word, and we look at the first example, the eagle, there are a few examples that I'll just take you through, and what we'll do is we'll look at the top and the anti-top of each of the examples that he gives us, and we can only marvel at just how his knowledge of God's word really is. And I'm going to put them up there. You know, it's said that the eagle sheds its feathers in the beginning of spring and with fresh plumage assumes the appearance of youth. It's an amazing creature. You know, you'll never find an eagle on low ground. It's always elevated. Here's the first example of how we ought to think. He's given us practical examples. This is what Olga is so good at. If we look at Psalm 103, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. He would have looked at this, brothers and sisters. He would have seen just the life cycle of the eagle. And he would have looked at God's word. And he would have just stood in awe. And that's why he pens these things. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. And here is a man, Augur. We don't know how old he was. We don't know at what age this was written in his life, but this we know. This is a man, brothers and sisters, that's coming near to closer to the end of his life. He asks and prays for a few things before I die. Do you think he would not have got encouragement from these words? Do you think that he would have not looked at the eagle and the renewing of that and thought to himself, this is where I want to be? Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. 
and they shall walk and not faint. This could not have been any better words of encouragement for Olga. And this I just love because I always, I use contemporary English version quite a bit, brothers and sisters, because I tell you what, it may not be the most accurate in a lot of different uh, uh, instances as far as perhaps maybe the best in relation to the Hebrew or the Greek. But they put things in such a simplistic way to bring out the beauty of a verse. And in Exodus 19, Moses went up to the mountain to meet Yahweh Elohim, who told him to say to the people, you saw what I did in Egypt. Absolutely they saw what he did in Egypt. Because they are brought out with a mighty hand. And you know how I brought you here to me. Just as a mighty eagle carries its young. And now you can understand, brothers and sisters, why he says that there are three things that are so wonderful. And he starts off with the eagle. <coughs> Contemporary English version carries on and says, Yahweh discovered you in a barren desert. He'd relate to that. Filled with howling winds. God became your fortress, protecting you as though you were his own eyes. How beautiful is that? Yahweh was like an eagle, teaching its young to fly. Always ready to swoop down and catch them on his back. And you know the interesting thing? When I showed you that video earlier on, brothers and sisters, about the eagle floating around, is the way the eagle does teach its young. It literally kicks it out of the nest. High up in the sky. But it floats down and if any of them can't make it, it actually supports them. And you'll see just from this from Sir Humphrey Davy, which I found explains it beautifully. It says, I once saw a very interesting sight above the crabs of Ben Nevis. For those who don't know where Ben Nevis is here. Ben Nevis is, it's in Scotland. Two parent eagles were teaching the offspring. Two young birds, the maneuvers of flight. They began by rising from the top of the mountain in the eye of the sun. It was about midday and bright for the climate. They first made small circles and the young birds imitated them. They paused on their wings Wait until they had made their flight. And then took a second and larger gyration. Always rising towards the sun and enlarging their circle of flight so as to make a gradual ascending spiral. The young ones still and slowly followed. Apparently flying better as they mounted and they continued the sublime exercise. Always rising until they became mere points in the air and the young ones were lost and afterwards the appearance to our, our aching sight. And you know this is the thing? If you watch it in real life, is they do this. And they always, always brothers and sisters, on the ascension, they have the eyes totally focused above. And because they have their eyes focused above, and because they are always leading the young, the young follow. This is an exceptional exhortation for us. Because this is what it's telling us is that if we are going to be the leaders, brothers and sisters, just like the eagle, our observation, everything that we do has to be focused on actually going up and keeping the Father firmly fixed in our sight. That is what we have to aspire to. What about the anti-type? Because he's always the anti-type. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle towards heaven. And I put these up because, not that I'm saying that we all run after money, I'm giving the anti-type as to where our focus should be and where our focus 
is sometimes in life. Because it generally, brothers and sisters, what actually happens is, this is just another example of how the world can creep into our own personal lives. Your money flies away before you know it, just like an eagle, suddenly taken off. <laughs> I thought that's pretty good with contemporary English version. My father always used to say to me, his salary is like a train. And I used to say to him, why? He says, because you watch it. He says, you see the train far in the distance. And it seems to take so long to get to you. And when it does, it's just <laughs> there for a split second that it's gone. Ain't that the truth? And this here says, set the trumpet in thy mouth. <coughs> She'll come as an eagle against the house of Yahweh. Why? Because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. It's actually interesting is that that word transgressed is the word achen. And what it actually means, it means to totally disregard. This is someone that is disregarding God's covenant. And it actually means more than disregard. It means to skip over in this sense. Like an ambitious person who wants to climb the ladder and he wants to get there. And he will get there at any cost, brothers and sisters, even if it means stepping over God's covenant. That's what the word means. And that's in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 1. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the cliffs of a rock, whose habitation is hard, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? We all go to that at some stage of our life, we are guilty of that. Thou, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle. So you can see the, the top and the anti-tops here, brothers and sisters. It says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest amongst the stars. And that's exactly what the eagle does. Like I said, you will never find it at low altitude. <laughs> Then will I bring thee down, saith Yahweh. The other beautiful thing about an eagle is its sight and its swiftness, its silence, and its ability to get its prey. And that we'll see a little bit later we will come to a few other examples in relation to the eagle. And he says, the way of a serpent upon a rock. I've always liked snakes, funny enough. I think they're actually very beautiful looking animals, very smooth. They don't feel the best to hold, I can assure you that. But take a look. Just take a look at the different examples of the serpent. As Moses lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man lift it up, that whoso believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The interesting thing about the serpent is this, is that there are two examples. There's the example of those who look upon the Son of God that was lifted up as a serpent. Believe in Him and believe in God's absolute love and the opportunity of deliverance that we have. That's also the sign that we have to be exceptionally careful, brothers and sisters. Because it is also the sign of doctrination coming in to the truth. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And we all know the story. We all know the story, brothers and sisters, of just how easy it is to be overwhelmed 
our circumstances. We can look at things and we can think to ourselves, well, it's not too bad. A little bit of tolerance. It's actually interesting when you look at the example in the, in the Garden of Eden, just how easy it is, just how easy, brothers and sisters, it is for us as humans to fail. You know, you, you think about it, you, you look at examples like that. You look at examples like the children of Israel in the wilderness, looking and seeing Moses working and Yahweh working through Moses and looking at the power that was displayed and looking at the nation of Egypt being absolutely decimated in a few seconds. And we think to ourselves, how could it be so ignoramus, if you want to call it that, of the Israelite people to turn their back on a God when they had such a display of power and such love shown towards them. But you know the funny thing? We're even better off than the children of Israel. Because we've got all those examples in Scripture, brothers and sisters, and guess what? We make the same mistakes. And we've got the example of them in Scripture telling us that we shouldn't be going there, and yet we do it. And the serpent said unto the woman, you won't die. You know what? That statement's been happening, brothers and sisters, since the Garden of Eden, until today. And still today, we are saying, we shall not surely die. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea. You know what's interesting about a ship? Besides they are magnificent pieces of creation, it's the fact that when you look at a ship and it's going, you actually don't really know the direction it's going. Unless it's going parallel to you. Then you can see it going across it. Even then, because of the error of parallax, if it actually turns slightly off, you don't know that. So there are reasons why Orga uses the examples that he does. And if you take a look over here, it says, They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of Yahweh and his wonders in the deep. That's what Orga is referring to. And yet, bear in mind, brothers and sisters, this is a man in northern Arabia. Do you think he strolled off down to the beach every so often? I don't think so. But he would have had examples in God's Word. And this is an example of the man. He probably, well, I can't really say that for sure. But I don't think this is a man that had an abundance of experience with the sea. And yet he makes these examples. He makes them because he would have looked. Everything that he did was from God's word. For he commanded and raised, raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waters thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is mounted, melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry to Yahweh. And that's the point that he's bringing. Just like Paul, remember? When, when they thought after so many days of not seeing sun that all hope of being saved was gone. Paul knew that they would be saved. He knew because he trusted explicitly in God. And that's what Orga is saying. 
when it is that you feel that you are the most at your most vulnerable brothers and sisters when you feel that there is no hope just like a ship that's in the sea with absolutely no control because it's just a small little speck on the big picture of the ocean God is in total control remember what Jesus said Lord the apostles come, the disciples come to him don't you care that we perish and he said peace be still and he was great calm then they cry unto Yahweh in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses he maketh the storm calm so that the waves thereof are still we have a very powerful God brothers and sisters a awesome God and this is a man, brothers and sisters, who had never seen any of these examples before in his life, and yet he knew that that is the kind of example that he needs to convey to us who are going to be reading this thousands of years later. Then are they glad because they be quiet? Isn't that what the disciples said? What manner of man is this? That even the weather obeys him. So he bringeth them out of the desire haven. Oh, that men would praise Yahweh for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. There's our example. There's our aspiration. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Is that what we do? Every single time, brothers and sisters, we make a decision. That is what has to be at the forefront of our mind. Are we exalting God in the decisions that we make? The way of a man with a maid. That would be one of the statements that I think is so, what's the word, misused. Because every time a brother I've seen puts it down there and they say, oh, such a beautiful picture, the way of a man with a maid. What that's actually referring to, brothers and sisters, is not the beauty around that relationship more the deception around that relationship because the man that comes with a maid because that's what he's looking at he, he wouldn't have looked at it from that aspect everything that he's done up till now brothers and sisters he's given us examples of the type and the anti-type and what he's actually saying is this is that the man has all his motives hidden and that is why it is related to the eagle and the serpent and the ship is because the maid does not even see it coming. She's led on a path that is based and built on deception. There is no trace or there is no sign of his intention. And that is why it actually makes reference to the fact and associated with the fact that of an adulterous woman there is a proverb that is stuck there and that is the culmination or if you want to call it the resultant of the first sonnet the number sonnet and I'm going to show you you know the contemporary English version says this when it refers to the adulterous woman it says an unfaithful wife says Sleeping with another man is as natural as eating. What it is saying, brothers and sisters, is as the adulterous woman lives a lie, so the man that comes and misleads the maid, only for him to vanish off, it's all about there being no trace. Everything about this, this entire build-up that Orga has done 
is the eagle that can fly and not leave any trail behind it. There's a snake that you can put in some sand and it'll leave tracks. But if you put it on a rock, there's nothing to say that it was there in the first place. There's the ship which is on the horizon. Now you see it, now you don't. If it goes in the water, unless it is very, very still water, you will not see the wake behind it. Five minutes later, there's nothing to say that that boat was there in the first place. And then it comes to the man. And that's why there is no change in argument. This is all about deception, brothers and sisters. This is all about the truth being led straight. That's what it's trying to teach us. It's about covering your sin. It's about doing things and not leaving any trail. You know what was interesting? I found this quite amazing. Believe it or not, I found this about two hours ago. I happen to be looking at Greek and Hebrew words, which as you know, I love doing. And I looked at the word adulterous. And for some reason I thought, well, hold on. And I went to Romans chapter 7, to verse 3, where it makes reference to the adulterous woman, which happens to be the word moichalit. Um, and then I looked at the Lesuit, or the, the, the um, equivalent word in the Hebrew. And it was the word na'af. The word is the identical <coughs> word which occurs only three times in the New Testament and three times in the Old Testament. The word adulterous. But what is so interesting about it is it occurs in Romans 7 and, and, and Proverbs 30. But when you look at the word which is associated is to be at the end of it to behave when she looks and she says I've done no wrong it's the word oven although it's got a V a W it's pronounced oven and it's from the, this is from the Barnes com, uh, complete expository dictionary and it says this oven in a deeper sense characterizes the way of life of those who are without God for the vile person will speak villainy and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy and to utter error against Yahweh to make an empty soul of the hungry and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail the being of a man is corrupted by by iniquity through all of mankind though sorry all of mankind is subject to oven toil there are those who delight in causing difficulties and misfortunes for others by scheming, lying, and acting deceptively. The psalmist puts internalized wickedness this way. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. In other words, I say to you, brothers and sisters, that that word adulterous woman is a way of life and it's saying that it is so deceptive that she will heart every single practice that she does and turn around and as simple as eating wiping her mouth and saying it's not a problem you may think it's a problem but it's not but the words used in context saying, and Orga is saying, it's a practice. And it's something that you are doing and it's a way of life. So the lessons to be learned in this is this. The eagle. This is the good side. With regards, brothers and sisters, to what we have to be aware of, 
It is something that can come from above. We won't know that it's on us until it is. <coughs> the serpent is not from above. The serpent is from below. Now, the other thing about an eagle is this incredible sight. But the part that Olga is saying that we have to aspire to, brothers and sisters, is if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And that is why in that number started, he gives a contrast between the eagle and the serpent. But you know what another other interesting thing about an eagle? His brothers and sisters, and, and I've been watching this, we, uh, we've been having these hawks that have been coming to our house, and just the absolute beauty of them. But the eagle is such, is that when it comes, nothing else is in its sight but the prize. And its entire body, brothers and sisters, works in sync with its movement. In other words, it visualizes it, and that is the prize that it goes for. And I put this up for you to see just how absolutely beautiful it is. And the example that Olga is trying to display is that when it's looking, it sets its mind on the target. It sets its mind on the prize. And it gets it. Because it has faith that it's going to get that. And it knows that it's going to get that. But what about the serpent? To exercise the mind. So we have been told to exercise our mind in one of two ways. To be having our minds focused on the prize or being like the serpent. And it means to entertain or have a sentiment or opinion by implication to be mentally disposed or less earnestly in a certain direction. We need to be focused, totally focused. Totally focused, like the eagle, with our affections, brothers and sisters, up there, like the eagle, at all times, spiring in upwards, drawing the brothers and sisters that are in the ecclesia with us towards that high calling, not going down, going up. If we are always consumed with daily activities, and this is just my thoughts, it's not scripture, then we will be not be part of God's great future enterprise. We have to tune in to headquarters up there, brothers and sisters, focused on God. We spend time with spiritual thinking, reading and study to understand the work of the eagle. That's what we have to aspire to. Lesson two, the eagle leaves no trace, it takes prey without warning, it's difficult to keep in sight, the serpent leaves no trace, totally camouflaged, totally camouflaged. You can be standing right next to it. You know in South Africa, one of the, one of the most deadly snakes in the world, and I think it's only just recently that there's been an antidote done for it, it's called the twig snake. If you look at it, it looks just like a match. It's got a little thing with a little blob on the end. And what it does is, it's why it's called a twig snake, is it'll sit in a, in a little tree and it wraps itself around it, just like a vine around it, and then it sticks its body straight out. You don't even know it's there. I remember going to the snake park in South Africa, and I remember it says twig snake, and I'm looking, where's the snake? He has a cigarette from my eyes, in front of my eyes. That is what it's talking about. It's camouflaged and we don't even know the danger that we're in. And it's deadly to humans. And that's when it talks about sin, brothers and sisters. 
and the ship leaves no trace, it's difficult to know the path, and it's totally unstable in rough seas. The man and the maid, he leaves no trace, his motives are deceptive, but he'll tell the maid everything she wants to know. But his motives aren't sincere. And that is the lesson that we get in this two verses of order. His actions are concealed. <coughs> lesson three. The adulterous woman. She too leaves no trace. But she's a culmination, brothers and sisters, of all those previous four things. Because she has no remorse for all the things that she introduces and for all the chaos she causes in people's lives, she has no remorse for it. And she totally believes she's right. I have done no wrong. Her actions are concealed, but more importantly, it's a way of life with her. She's deceived herself in a respect that, as far as she's concerned, there is nothing wrong with her actions. Even though she's an adulterous woman. And it's telling us, brothers and sisters, that she is living that life. And yet, what have I done wrong? And just the mere fact that what it says, and Brother Alec Crawford in his book, The Proverbs, actually says, the mere fact that she wipes her mouth is almost the fact that she is smirking and saying, Gotcha. Lesson four and the closing of our subject. God is our strength and the way of the world. We have two choices. That has always been a choice. It is the choice now, and it will always be the choice in the truth. There's the way of the spirit, and there's the way of the flesh. And all our brothers and sisters saw that in all its splendor. <coughs> and for him, it was a no-brainer. He looked at the way of the flesh, and he knew that the way of the flesh ended up in death. But with the way of the Spirit, he said, elevates us to a whole new level. We are to offer sacrifices of righteousness and we put our trust in Yahweh. It is better to trust in Yahweh than to put confidence in men. Yahweh is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiced, and my song will I praise Him. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and unworldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus chapter 2. In the way of the flesh. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because everything in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world that it desires is coming to an end. But he who does God's pleasure is living forever. That is such a powerful example of a man, brothers and sisters, thousands of years ago, who wrote one proverb that most of us would just skip past and not give it a second thought. And yet, there is such a power in God's Word. And that is why I believe that when Olga says, Every word of Yahweh is pure and true. That is why 
I firmly believe that if we are to unleash the power of God's word, reading it superficially will never do because we'll never come to the beauty of what God is trying to tell us. We have the privilege of kings, brothers and sisters, to be able to look deep into God's word and to come to the beauty that he has set in store for those who love and fear his most holy name and to keep his statutes and his commandments until the very end.